So hello everybody, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I heartily welcome you uh, to this afternoon section um, of the 12th annual ILETS meeting here in Toronto. And uh, I'm convinced that you will get a lot of uh, necessary information during the following uh, lectures and presentations. And uh, I hope that, uh, uh, that it will be really very, very interesting for you. So may I now announce the first speaker. The first speaker of this afternoon breakout session will be Christine Green, a medical doctor uh, from California. Uh, Christine Green is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Reed College in Biology and Ecology, an appropriate choice for a doctor treating tick-borne diseases. She completed her medical training at the University of California, San Diego, and then went on her family practice residency at Stanford University. Dr. Green works at Green Oaks Medical Center in Los Altos. She is the chair of ILETS Medical Education Committee. It's up to you. Hello, thank you, Armin. Um, I'm going to do a quick advertisement first as chair of the ILADS Education Committee. Um, on Sunday between 8.45 and 11.15, we're going to have an education committee meeting to try to figure out what the community most wants from the education committee. It has bagels and juice and coffee, and it's in the Ontario room. There is a sheet of paper going around, I hope, asking for um, you to sign up if you're interested in commenting to the Education Committee so we can contact you. All right, advertisement done. So I'm going to talk to you about some co-infections and some coexisting infections that we have to think about in chronic Lyme disease. After me, Richard Horowitz is going to talk to you about Babesia, so I'm not going to talk about that. Oh, conflicts. I don't think I have any conflicts. I volunteer and work on some boards, but there are none that I can think of. This is Bob Bransfield's statement on the top, so I thought I should say that. Now, what, what is chronic Lyme disease? I'm borrowing here from uh, Dr. Horowitz. Um, what seems to be true is that it is chronic multiple infectious disease. Very seldom do you find a chronic Lyme patient that you can't find another organism co-infecting. David Owens, another ILADS member, has written a um, paper in Medical Hypothesis with the query, is Lyme disease always polymicrobial? Last year at this conference, Jose Montoya presented his data on chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, presenting it as a multiple viral infection. And then Paul Ewald, also here last year, presented very interesting data about chlamydia pneumoniae in conjunction with a genetic predisposition and epigenetics, kind of environmental um, interactions causing chlamydial infection, chronic chlamydial infection. So that's what we're talking about. Hmm, there we go. I ran through the first one, hold on. There we go. So which co-infections do you look for? This is actually a somewhat difficult question. I have a patient who's an MD who's tested herself for over 80 co-infections and found 19 of them. Probably not necessary. There are only so many bugs and there are only so many drugs. But the more you know about what you're treating, the more successful will be your treatment. So we look for the Babesias, we look for the Ehrlichias, we look for the Bartonellas, Mycoplasma, now, BART and mycoplasma have the question of, are these tick-borne infections or are these more uh, opportunistic infections that come into play? 
And then there's, there's hundreds of them, depending where you are. There's tularemia. I just saw a woman who I thought had Rocky Mountain spotted fever. She didn't, she had babesiosis, but her palms lit up. Um, Powassan virus, relapsing fever. And then these are, I'm not going to talk about 80 plus co-infections, I'm going to talk about a few. These are the coexisting infections, except for Coxsackie that I'm going to touch on. This is a reminder, I think every speaker today has done this, to say they're different ticks, know a little bit about your ticks, have an idea of what's carried in what ticks. There's the hard-bodied ticks and the soft-bodied ticks. Most of the time, the patient's not going to present with a tick, but it's good to know in your area what ticks are there, or maybe in the area your patient just went hunting, or the area your patient decided to do a garden tour in. And then again, different ticks carry different diseases. So how, this is something else I find patients don't understand, and I think we need to get the information out there. A patient will say, I can't have Lyme disease, there are no deer anywhere I go. And so it's important to remember that it's not the deer, they're a necessary host, but it's not the deer that communicate this into the human's world. It's the rodents. In California, Bob Lane has showed that eight out of 10 squirrels in Northern California carry uh, uh, Borrelia. And, and so it's those little mice, you know, that scuttle around, and the shrews, et cetera. Um, Ostfeld just wrote a book, The Ecology of Lyme Disease, where he goes to great lengths to explain how hard it is. If, if you're out in the field and you pick up a rodent and you're looking for the ticks on the rodent, well, mice don't have any fur in their ears, so you see a lot of ticks there. But most of the other ones have a lot of fur, so like the shrews, the only way they figured out the shrews may be the main carrier is to bring them back in the laboratory and make them live in little cages for a while so they can drop the ticks off. So it's the rodents. So how to know, talk to your vets. Your vets are going to know what's around in the community. Are you urban, suburban, or rural? And where, um, with your patients, remember travel matters. You know, remember if they've been hiking in Indonesia, it's going to be a different group of things you're looking for than if they were in their backyard planting something. I love this map. I show it at all my talks. This is Susan Little's work. I'm sorry I don't have something for Toronto here. Um, but she is a vet, research vet, and she took a million and a half tests on dogs countrywide and looked at how many had Lyme disease. And then she compared them with how many um, how many human reported. So if you look at Colorado, 998 dogs had Lyme disease. You can't see this, but only one human did. Over there in Oregon, 539, only 77. A patient in Oregon cannot get treated for Lyme disease. They have to leave the state. Um, you can also look at reviews of different diseases and very quickly get an idea of if they found that disease in your area. This is an old one from 2001 where they were kind of mapping out the Ehrlichias. All of these co-infections I'm talking about today are emerging diseases. None of them have been out that long or have we understood them that long. So a lot of information isn't there. You will end up in your practice getting a sense of what's out there, as long as you're careful in your questions and your differentials and you keep looking. So what do you test for? Geographic. And then this, I don't expect you to read, it's just interesting, this is from Dr. Breitschwert, um, that we're really understanding these bugs in a genetic sense more than we used to, and we're renaming them as a result. So HGE is now anaplasma phagocytophilium. Um, but what's, what's true about every bacteria I'm going to mention today is they're tiny, they're intracellular, and they can all persist. There's evidence that every one of them has a way to do persistent infection in the literature. 
So I'm going to start with Bartonella. I would normally start with Babesia because I treat that first usually, but Dr. Horowitz will talk about Babesia. So Bartonella, is it tick-borne? We cannot say for sure that it's tick-borne to humans, even though...